Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, life in the solar system and is it out there and how exactly do we go about finding it? Because as you can imagine, um, trying to find life in our solar system is a pretty difficult thing to do. Um, so just to give you a little bit more of a background about what I do and what I um, do in astrophysics and astronomy. Um, I started out as an astrophysicist, as a researcher, and I've done that for about 10 years now. And what I am is an observational astronomer, and that means that I use telescopes to study space. And I mainly use radio telescopes to do that. And what I was particularly interested in was studying um, how solar systems form, and um, so how stars and planets form, but also the possibilities for life in our own solar system. So those are just a few pictures of me at different telescopes around the world. Um, I've now pretty much left research and I work um, in public engagement and public outreach and I'm the senior manager of public astronomy here at the Royal Observatory. But I have been involved in some research recently, um, including a study that you may have heard of um, about the possibility for life on the planet Venus. Now I'm just gonna apologize in advance if you do hear any cats crying in the background. I do have two little kittens um, <laughs> that, that sometimes they do miss me when I, when I give talks in another room. So just apologize for that in advance if you do hear any kittens crying in the background. But they'll, they'll eventually quiet down if you hear that. Okay, so the outline of what I'm planning to, to talk about today is, first of all, what do we mean by life when we're talking about searching for life in the solar system? How do we search for life? Uh, because that, like I said, is pretty difficult to do. Where do we want to search for life in the solar system? And what are all the different places we can search for, for life? Where are all of those? Um, what missions have we done so far? And what is the research that we have on life in the solar system so far? And lastly, what is there left to do? Because spoiler alert, there's a lot left to do um, for searching for life in the solar system. There's many unanswered questions that we have. Now, to kick everything off, um, the search for life. Um, normally, when you tell people that you're searching for life in the solar system or you're interested in that, normally people instantly think of the search for little green men um, or aliens in the solar system. And so they picture this um, these aliens in their minds that might be in a flying saucer, kind of flying around, exploring the galaxy and having adventures and things like that. Now, when we talk about life, this isn't the kind of life that we're talking about when we're searching for life in our solar system and beyond. Really what you're thinking about when you think about aliens in a spaceship or something like that, you're thinking about life that is similar to humans. And so what we would call complex and intelligent life in astronomy. Now, even the, the term complex and intelligent life is pretty controversial because I think a lot of people could argue that humans aren't necessarily the most intelligent life even on the planet Earth all the time. But really what, what you're thinking about when we say complex and intelligent life, we mean a form of life that... Um, is able to communicate um, using some sort of language or a life that is able to manipulate its environment or change its environment to help it survive. So for example, humans create civilizations on the earth. They uh, create cities, they build buildings, um, and they even build things like canals that can transport water and help their survival. When it comes to complex and intelligent life, we've pretty much ruled that out in our solar system other than on the Earth. And the reason why that is, is because we have spacecraft that have been able to explore our solar system and take pictures of the planets and study those planets in more detail. And when we don't find any evidence for complex and intelligent life in our solar system. Um, there's still a lot that we don't know about the planets, but it's just that we've been able to rule out um, complex and intelligent life because of the lack of evidence. So when we're talking about life, the kind of life we're talking about is a more subtle form of life. It's life that's going to be more similar to microbial life, so microbes or microorganisms, or even more similar to animals. 
So it can still be complex life, it just won't be intelligent in the way that I explained uh, before. So then, um, instead of asking why are there no little green men in the solar system, a better question we can ask is why is life hard to find in our solar system? Now, what we know about the Earth is that every form of life that we see on the Earth, um, even down to the smallest microbes, every form of life will need liquid water in order to survive. Um, and so really, when it comes to looking for life in other places, what we really want to see a lot of the time is um, we want to find liquid water. And that's a good indication that there could be life also present if we also find liquid water in other places in our solar system. But actually what we know about the planets so far is that they have, first of all, most, uh, well, the planets, uh, the rest of the planets in our solar system, they don't have liquid water on their surfaces. And also they have very extreme environments compared to the Earth. So just as an example, if we go to Mercury and Venus, we know that Mercury and Venus are incredibly hot and they don't have any liquid water on their surfaces. If we go to the planet Mars, which is a little bit further away from the sun, it's going to be colder than the Earth because it's further away from the sun. It doesn't get as much light and heat from the sun that we do. Um, it's not only cold, but it also doesn't have liquid water on its surface. Um, if we go out to Jupiter, it's even colder. It has lots of radiation present, um, which can be particularly damaging to life. It also doesn't have liquid water. And then if we go to the outer planets in the solar system, so Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they're even colder than the planet Jupiter, and they don't have liquid water either. So life is hard to find because we're looking for a more subtle form of life, but also we don't see liquid water uh, present anywhere else in the solar system, and these environments are incredibly extreme compared to the Earth. But one thing we can do is we can actually look at life on the Earth that is able to exist in extreme conditions, and we can compare it to some of the extreme conditions that we see in our own solar system to get a better idea of the possible life that might exist in uh, planets in our solar system, in other planets uh, in our solar system, and even in on moons in our solar system as well, because we not only have planets making up our solar system, but we also have over 150 moons. Um, and moons really are kind of like their own worlds in and of themselves as well. So let's take a look at some of the extreme forms of life that live on the Earth that could potentially exist in other places in our solar system. So these forms of life that live in extreme conditions on the Earth, they're called extremophiles. So they're just named after the extreme conditions in which they live. And extremophiles come in different categories. And the categories are based on the type of extreme environment that they live in. So just to give you an example of all the different kinds of extremophiles we find here in the solar system, um, we have acidophiles. Acidophiles live in incredibly acidic conditions um, here on the Earth. We also have alkalophiles, which live in incredibly alkaline conditions on the Earth. We have barophiles, and barophiles are forms of life that can withstand very high pressures on the Earth. So these pressures are high enough to crush the human body, but barophiles happily live in these very extreme conditions. We also have uh, extremophiles that are called indoliths. Now indoliths um, are able to live in the porous conditions of rocks and minerals. And so they literally live in the cracks and the holes in these rocks and minerals. So if you think of things like lichen, or it's sometimes pronounced lichen, um, that is a form uh, of an indolith. And indoliths can actually live around three kilometers below the surface of the earth. And actually we don't know how far down they can survive because it's very difficult to dig more than three kilometers below the surface of the earth. So they can be incredibly extreme forms of life. We also have xerophiles, which even though every form of life on the earth um, needs liquid water to survive, 
zero files can exist in um, environments that don't have much water at all. So they don't really need that much liquid water to survive. We also have thermophiles. Thermophiles um, exist in very hot environments. So if you think of boiling temperatures, that's where thermophiles can live. We also have radio resistant forms of life, which um, this is a form of life that can exist in very high um, or in very extreme radiation scenarios. So if you think of inside of nuclear reactors, that's where radio resistant um, extreme files can live. We also have psychrophiles, which psychrophiles exist in very cold conditions. And then lastly, we have polyextremophiles, which can exist in many different kinds of extreme environments. So I know I've thrown a lot of terms at you right now, but let me give you some examples of um, extremophiles that we find here on the Earth. So we have iron eaters or ferroplasma acidophyllum. Iron eaters are um, a, a, a single-celled organism, they're a microbe, um, and they exist mainly in acid mine drainings. So they are acidophiles, they exist in very acidic conditions. And the conditions that they live in are very similar to the acidity that you find in gastric acid, so stomach acid, for example. They exist in very little sunlight, they don't really need um, sunlight in order to survive. Um, and uh, also they, they exist through chemosynthesis. And so um, they're able to um, exist through um, different chemical reactions. And so that's how they're able to survive in these very extreme conditions. Okay, now this is probably my favorite extremophile because of its name. It's called a snotite. It's a bacteria. And a snotite exists in a cave. So they exist in caves. And they're quite similar to stalactites. Um, stalactites are not living, uh, but a stalactite is a, a geological formation inside of a cave. Normally you can see them hanging from cave ceilings. And so it's a rock that ends up forming from a cave ceiling that kind of comes down into a point. Um, a snotite is like a stalactite, except it's alive. And the reason why it's called a, a snotite is because it is the texture of mucus or snot. Now, snotites are really weird. Um, they're acidophiles, so they exist in very acidic conditions. Um, the acidities that they can withstand can be up to 100 times more acidic than car battery acid. Um, so again, they're very extreme forms of life. And actually, scientists who study snotites, they've actually been burned uh, by snotites. So just the acid dripping off of them can burn through clothing and it can give uh, the scientists third degree burns. Um, so, so again, they are incredibly extreme. Um, so, so those are snotites. Let's move on. So I have two more extreme files I just wanna go over. The next one is strain 121 or Geogemma ferrosi. Strain 121 seems like, it almost sounds like something that can infect you. It sounds a bit scary but these actually are not harmful to humans. And I'll explain why in just a moment. Strain 121 um, is a microbe that exists um, on, uh, on the sea floor uh, around uh, volcanic activity or what we call hydrothermal vents. And so these are volcanic vents on the sea floor. Um, they actually exist in environments that are around 121 degrees Celsius which is why they're called strain 121. So it's talking about the temperature that they exist in. But there is, so this is higher than boiling temperatures at the bottom of the seafloor. They can actually exist though all the way up to 130 degrees Celsius. Now, before strain 121 was found, um, which was in the early 2000s, we actually thought that any form of life on the earth, if you heated it up to 120 degrees Celsius, for uh, 10 minutes that it would die. But strain 121 actually happily exists in those very hot environments. Now, the reason why um, strain 121 isn't infectious to humans and isn't harmful to humans is actually because our body temperature is too cold for strain 121 to exist in. And so we're 37 degrees Celsius, strain 121 wants 120 degrees Celsius and above. 
And so that's the reason why they're not harmful to us. And lastly, this is a form of life that you may have heard of before. So these are tardigrades, and they're sometimes called water bears or moss piglets. Um, now tardigrades are actually probably one of the most indestructible forms of life on the earth. And the reason why that is, they're, they're polyextremophiles, so they exist in many different extreme conditions. They can actually survive the vacuum of space for at least up to 10 days. They can also survive um, very high pressures. So um, kind of six times larger than the pressure that we find um, in the deepest trenches here on the earth. So in the deepest ocean tr trenches that we find here on the earth. They can also survive radiation temperatures that are a hundred times higher than the lethal dose for humans. And they can exist in very cold environments and very hot environments. So all the way down to nearly absolute zero. So around minus 270 degrees tardigrades can survive in all the way up to 150 degrees Celsius. So many different temperatures. They're pretty indestructible. Tardigrades are macroscopic, so they're a little bit bigger than the microbes that I was talking about, but you would still need to see them under a microscope, really, in order to find them. Now, to give you an idea of what they're like, they do mainly need water in order to kind of live happily. So they can go into stasis without water. They can kind of almost dry up and, and go into a stasis mode, but with water, they can reanim reanimate and move around. But this is how we think they move around in water. They kind of have eight legs and they swim around. If they were much bigger, it, I mean, if tardigrades were the size of a dog, they would be a little scarier than perhaps what they are now. They kind of look a bit cute though when they're, when they're so small. <clears throat> okay, so now that you know the kinds of life, that we're looking for in space, that we're not looking for complex and intelligent life. We're looking for life that's more similar to microbes or macroscopic life or even animals. It can still be complex. It's just, it's not going to be intelligent life that can communicate with us or life that can, that will kind of build civilizations or change it in its environment in order to survive. So now that we know the kind of life we're looking for, how is it that we can search for this more subtle form of life in our solar system? So we can do that in a few different ways. First of all, we can use telescopes in order to um, study the possibility for life in space. And using telescopes is what I particularly specialize in. Now we can use telescopes here either on the ground we can also use telescopes that are located out in space as well in orbit around the Earth. So ground telescopes and space telescopes. And what these telescopes are going to be looking for are different kinds of gases that might be produced by life. Um, so for example, if we talk about humans, yes, humans are an intelligent form of life, but also humans will affect their environments in different ways as well. So for example, humans are breathing in oxygen all the time, that's what I'm breathing in right now, and we're exhaling carbon dioxide. So humans are producing carbon dioxide gas. Plants, on the other hand, are doing the opposite. They're intaking carbon dioxide and they're producing oxygen. Well, microbes and other animals as well they will be producing different types of gases. So for example, we have some microbes that will produce methane gas, for example. So by looking and searching for specific kinds of gases, we can look for evidence of life, both um, in the atmospheres of planets, but also in the atmospheres of moons and in other places, in our, in our solar system, but also further out in space, in our galaxy, in other galaxies, things like that. So we can use telescopes to do that. And telescopes, I think, are probably the most straightforward way for searching for life. Um, they cost the, the less as well. So they're the least risky because we have the telescopes either here on the ground or in orbit out um, or in, in orbit around the Earth, so much closer by. We can also use flyby missions in order to search for life in our solar system. 
So a flyby mission is when you send a spacecraft out to a planet or a moon or whatever you're looking at, and it flies by whatever you're looking at. Um, you, the, the bad thing is that you only have one shot <laughs> to fly by um, the planet or moon that you're studying, but you get a close-up view of that planet or moon. So that's why flyby missions are good. You get the close-up view, but you only have one shot to do that. Now, you can also use orbiters. And so an orbiter is like a flyby, but it just orbits the planet or moon or whatever object that you're studying. So you get more than one chance to study um, uh, and, and to search for life in those places. So we also have orbiter missions. And then we have more technical missions as well. So if whatever you're studying has a surface, so if it's a rocky planet or if it's a moon with the surface, then you can also um, land a spacecraft on the surface uh, of the planet or moon. And so these are landers and rovers. And so a lander and a rover can actually study um, the, the ground, so study different rocks uh, in those different environments and um, get a closer up view uh, of those environments as well. And then lastly, other missions that we can do, this is probably the most technical mission that we could do is a sample return mission. And that's where we actually send a spacecraft or a lander out to a planet. It lands on, on the planet, for example, or a moon. And then it actually takes a sample of the planet or moon and brings it back to the Earth. Now, this is the most technical kind of mission, but this is also, um, uh, this is the ideal, really, of what we would want. Uh, because we could take that sample and really study um, in a laboratory um, the, the sample that was brought back from a planet or moon or whatever object we're studying in our solar system. But technically, that's a really challenging thing to do, and it's really difficult to do, and it's also very expensive. Um, so really, what I've shown you here is how we can search for life, kind of the most straightforward method, all the way up to the most technically challenging method. Now, the method that I have particularly used in the past to look for life in our solar system is using telescopes, and specifically searching for gases that could indicate life in these environments. Now, the way to search for a gas using a telescope is by using a method called spectroscopy. Um, so um, an example of how you would use spectroscopy to search for a gas, uh, I'm going to use our sun, at least in the beginning. So you can see a picture of our sun in the lower right hand corner. And our sun is a star. It's the star at the center of our solar system. It's emitting light all the time. Now, the light that's coming from our sun, even though to our eyes it looks kind of like a whitish or a yellowish light, really the sun's producing many different colors of light all the time, or what we call wavelengths of light. So a wavelength of light corresponds to colors of light. But all of those colors combine together to kind of uh, turn into that yellowish or white light that we can see with our eyes. What you can do is pass that light through something like a prism and you can separate that light out into its individual colors. And when we do that, when we separate that light out into its individual colors or wavelengths, we call that a spectrum from our sun. And you can actually do that to any star that you're looking at and you can do that to many different objects in space as well and you can get a spectrum of their light. And so what you're looking at here on the left, so what looks like a rainbow strip, that's actually a spectrum of our sun. So it's just the light of the sun spread out into its individual colors or wavelengths. Now what's really special is that as that light is passing through the different layers of our sun's atmosphere, certain gases will actually absorb light at very specific colors or wavelengths. And so if you'll notice in that kind of strip uh, of rainbow colors uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll notice that there are black lines through specific colors in our sun spectrum. Those black lines are caused by gas that absorbs the light at very specific colors or wavelengths. And so this is almost like a barcode of our sun. Our sun has a very unique barcoder spectrum and every star will have a very unique barcoder spectrum that corresponds to what the sun or whatever the object is you're looking at is made up of. So just by looking at our sun spectrum, you can figure out what the sun is made of. So for example, 
the black lines that I've pointed out here correspond to the hydrogen gas that the sun's made up of. We also have helium that makes up the sun. We have oxygen as well, sodium, magnesium, calcium, iron, and mercury. And there's a few other gases that I haven't pointed out as well. Um, but you get a, a good idea of what the sun is mainly made up of. Now, just like certain gases can absorb light at very specific colors, gases can also emit light at very specific colors. And so if you take a gas and heat it up or um, inject some sort of energy into it, then that gas will begin to glow. And so this is an example of if you take different gases like hydrogen, helium, lithium, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and neon, and if you heat them up, or apply a certain amount of energy to them, they will begin to glow at very specific colors. Now, this is very similar to if you imagine neon lights in uh, the front of a shop or in the front of a bar, um, then all that is is neon gas that has an electrical current applied to it. So an energy is being injected into that gas and neon gas will begin to glow pink. And so that's, a very similar thing to actually what we're seeing in space. So if you take gases in space, heat them up, then they will also begin to glow, just like neon lights in the front of a shop. So you can see gases absorbing light and you can see gases emitting light. And when we use a spectrometer on a telescope, that will actually help you figure out what gases you're looking at in space. And then depending upon the type of gas it is, you can then see if it might actually be produced by life in the environment that you're looking at. Okay, so now that you know the kind of life that we're looking at, so maybe similar sorts of life that we have here on the earth, you know how we can search for that life, either by gases or by actually sending spacecraft directly to a planet or a moon in our solar system and searching uh, for, for life in that way. Um, Let's see what we found out so far about life in our solar system. Now, in my talk, I'm only going to focus on two planets and two moons, but that doesn't mean those are the only places that we can search for life in the solar system. I've mainly focused on planets and moons, but we also have comets and asteroids in our solar system as well that we could also potentially search for life. So if you wanna know more about that, ask me about that at the end of the talk. Um, but like I said, I focused on two planets and two moons in, in, in the talk today. The first planet I wanna talk about is Venus. And um, I, I do also, I am gonna mention uh, the work that I was involved in, in the recent discovery of this very rare gas uh, in Venus's atmosphere that could indicate life. Now, first of all, um, if you know anything about Venus, it might seem strange to pick Venus out and to search for life on the planet Venus, but there is a reason why there could be life on the planet Venus. Now, the reason why, I, well, so throughout history, Venus was often thought of as Earth's twin, and that's because Venus is, very, is a very similar size to the Earth, um, and it's also... Um, around the same distance from the sun as the Earth is. It's a bit closer to the sun, but still it, it's, it's a similar distance to the sun th than what the Earth is, or as what the Earth is. Venus is in a part of our solar system that we call the habitable zone. Now the habitable zone is this imaginary ring that exists around every star. And really what we're trying to define when we talk about the habitable zone is the distance from a star that a planet will need to be to be at the right temperature for liquid water to possibly exist on its surface. So the Earth is smack dab in the middle of the sun's habitable zone. And, um, and the reason why we have so much liquid water on the Earth is because liquid water can exist on the Earth. Um, and, uh, and it's because the Earth's at the right temperature for liquid water to exist. Venus is right on the inner edge of our habitable zone. So it's a little bit closer to the sun than the Earth is. And so that means it's gonna be hotter, but still it's right on the edge of the habitable zone. 
And actually the planet Mars is actually on the edge, on the outer edge of the habitable zone um, when it comes to our own solar system. So one of the reasons why Venus is exciting though is because it's on that inner edge of the habitable zone. However, even though Earth, or even though Venus was often thought of as Earth's twin over the years, and it is kind of on the edge of the habitable zone, Venus is incredibly different to the Earth. And it's different to the Earth in a few different ways. So first of all, Venus is incredibly hot. And even though it's on the edge of the habitable zone, it doesn't have any liquid water on its surface because of how hot it is. So the average temperature on the surface of Venus is over 450 degrees Celsius. So it's incredibly hot. Also, the pressures on the surface of this planet are very high. So it would be like being about a thousand meters below um, sea level here on the Earth. So it's definitely high enough to crush the human body. Not only that, um, Venus is surrounded by these clouds that are made out of sulfuric acid, and they're inc incredibly acidic clouds, I should say. Um, they're kind of made up of 80 to 90 percent acid, um, so they are pretty nasty. Um, and also, Venus's atmosphere is 95 percent, so nearly entirely made of carbon dioxide, so it's poisonous to humans. So really, if we ever sent someone to the planet Venus, the question isn't, um, would they die? But what would get them first out of the things that, that I mentioned? Um, so Venus, Venus is a pretty hellish place. Now, even though that we know that Venus has a very harsh environment compared to the Earth, um, from, I mean, from about 60 years ago, so 50 to 60 years ago, the Soviet Union actually sent probes to the surface of Venus to study what Venus's surface was like and to also take some of the first pictures of the surface of Venus. And so this is what the surface of Venus actually looks like. These were the Venera missions. And um, it, it was actually several missions um, that were a part of the Venera project that went to Venus, but not all of the probes that landed on the surface of the planet actually worked. Um, so some of them had um, cameras that failed and various things like that. Um, but still, there were a handful of the missions that actually um, the, the cameras did work and we were able to get some images from the surface of the planet. Um, so here's one and here's a few color images of uh, the surface of the planet Venus. So you can see it is a pretty terrifying place. Um, and you know, you're looking at a scorched, kind of baked, barren desert um, that stretches uh, across the entirety of the surface of this planet. So then why on earth would we want to search for life in a place that's so hellish and horrible? Well, Venus, we actually think, wasn't always um, the sort of hellscape that we know it today, that we know it to be today. So um, one to two billion years ago, it's very possible that Venus was cooler than what it is today. And it's very possible that liquid water actually existed on the surface of Venus. Um, now, un unfortunately, over time, as the sun heated up, um, what ended up happening was you had the runaway greenhouse gas effect uh, on the surface of the planet Venus and all of the water evaporated um, from, from the surface uh, out. Um, but it's very possible that if you did have liquid water on the surface of Venus that existed potentially for billions of years, then it's possible that life existed on Venus at some point. Um, and if, li if life did exist on, on Venus at some point, then as Venus began to heat up, it's possible that life could still exist on Venus today, but instead of on the surface of the planet, it could have migrated upward into Venus's clouds. Now, Venus's clouds are a lot more mild. Um, so if you go 50 to 60 kilometers above the surface of the planet, um, up into the cloud layer, its uh, temperatures are more like 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, so a lot more reasonable. And the pressures are much lower as well. So more similar to pressures on the surface of the Earth. Now you still have a very acidic environment, but still you have a much more reasonable temperatures and pressures. Now you might think that 
life existing in the clouds of Venus or kind of floating in the clouds of Venus, um, this aerial life, you might think that that sounds a little far-fetched, but even on the Earth, we have aerial life that exists up in the clouds, so a microbial life that exists in the clouds. So it's not as far-fetched as, as what you might think. Now, that leads us to um, the study that I was a part of. Um, so I was a, a part of this study that found an unusual gas in Venus's atmosphere called phosphine. Now, the reason why the, our team wanted to, to search for phosphine gas coming from Venus is because phosphine is a type of gas that's called a biomarker or a biosignature gas. And so what that means is that phosphine is directly connected to life. Phosphine gas on rocky planets, like the Earth, for example, is pretty much only produced by life. Um, so on the Earth, it's just very difficult to produce this, this phosphine gas. So you don't have high enough temperatures or pressure to, to produce phosphine gas. Um, and so the idea is that on any rocky planet, it's a gas that's really hard to produce other than if you have um, uh, uh, life present that's able to produce phosphine. On the Earth, the main thing um, that we find producing phosphine are microbes or, or microorganisms. And actually, it's a really bizarre phenomenon, um, but you see phosphine directly connected to things like penguins um, in Antarctic maritime environments. And the reason why that is, is because inside of penguin guts, you have lots of microbes and they're all releasing phosphine gas. And so literally as penguins poo, and leave their, their waste on the ground in Antarctica, um, you have phosphine gas that hovers over that waste. And so there's a direct connection, for example, between phosphine gas and penguins, but it's because of the microorganisms that's found in the guts of penguins. Um, phosphine's also found in, in the guts of other animals as well. So for example, um, I've been told um, that, that you can find um, phosphine gas in baby poo as well, so human baby poo, and that's because of the microorganisms that, that exist in, in baby's guts. So, um, so like I said, phosphine is mainly produced by life here on the earth though, and so that's what spurred our team to, um, to just um, search for phosphine um, in Venus's environment because we knew it was going to be difficult to produce this gas in um, a, a, a way that involved purely chemistry that didn't involve life. And so when we went searching for phosphine, we didn't actually think that we would find phosphine gas. Um, I think what we thought was that we would search for it, we might not necessarily find it, um, but it would still be a good experiment to try to see if we could find this gas in another rocky planet environment. Um, and we actually did um, end up finding the gas um, with two different telescopes. So the James Cook Maxwell telescope um, in Hawaii, and then we also confirmed the observation of phosphine gas uh, with the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or ALMA for short, in Chile. And so you can see the spectra. Um, so this is phosphine gas that's absorbed light in the atmosphere of Venus in the top um, right hand um, uh, of this particular slide. Now what's really exciting is that we found phosphine gas that's coming from uh, Venus's clouds in the environment that we think has more reasonable temperatures for life and the amount of phosphine gas um, that we find is so great that we currently can't explain what's producing phosphine. So we know that the natural chemistry that's happening on the planets that we know of so far can't produce the amount of phosphine that we see. So that either means that um, there's something that we haven't considered happening on the planet Venus that's producing the phosphine, or there's a possibility that life could be creating the phosphine in Venus's clouds. Okay, now I'm running a little out of time, so I'm, I'm going to, to move on to the planet uh, Mars next. Now, Mars, I mentioned, is also in the habitable zone in our solar system, but it's on the outer edge of the habitable zone. And that's going to mean that Mars is a little bit colder um, than, than the Earth, just because it's further away from the sun. But what's interesting about Mars is that it does have a similar tilt as the Earth, so that means it has seasons like the Earth. 
and its temperature range is a little more reasonable. It's not too cold. I mean, it does get down to minus 140 degrees at its poles, but at its equator, it actually goes up to 20 degrees. So again, it, it's not too bad. It's a little more mild, but its average temperature is about minus 60 degrees Celsius. So it is pretty cold. Now, what's exciting for Mars is that even though we don't have liquid water on its surface, we do see some frozen water on the surface at the poles. Um, but what's, what's really fascinating is that um, there seems to be evidence of a liquid water uh, lake below its surface, very close um, to its poles. And actually, there was evidence found by radar in 2018 and more evidence found actually this year that came out just a couple of months ago. So it's an exciting possibility that there could be a liquid water lake though below um, its surface. And it's very possible that the kinds of life that might exist on Mars include things like indoliths and so lichen, like I mentioned before. And so this is the type of life that exists in the porous conditions of rocks or even in the cracks of rocks, uh, for example. Um, and the endoliths that we find here on the Earth, I mentioned, exist very far below the ground here on the Earth as well. So it could be a possibility um, for, for Mars for these endoliths to exist. Now, also, I mentioned that I was going to talk about um, some moons in the solar system. And there's a couple of different moons that are really exciting possibilities um, for ha having the potential for life. Now, Enceladus is a very tiny moon that orbits Saturn. It's about six times smaller than our own moon. And before the Cassini spacecraft actually flew out to Saturn and studied some of Saturn's moons, um, not really, not much was thought of uh, when, when um, Enceladus was talked about. Um, but what Cassini was able to send back to us, um, so Cassini studied Saturn for about 13 years, all the way up until 2017. And it took many pictures, not only of Saturn, but also of Saturn's moons. And so this is an image of Enceladus that the Cassini spacecraft took here on the left. And you can see that the moon is covered in this layer of ice and it has lots of cracks in its surface. But the exciting thing that Cassini discovered is that actually there are geysers extending from the bottom of the moon and it's throwing ice and gas actually out into space. Now you can actually see the geysers in the right hand image. And this is again, both of these images the Cassini spacecraft took, but on the right hand image, you can see the gas and the ice that is actually being thrown out of the bottom of this moon. Now these geysers are actually produced by oceans below the surface of Enceladus, which is, these oceans are actually made of liquid water, very similar to the liquid water oceans that we find here on the Earth. Now, the way that we think in Enceladus is structured is that you have this thick layer of ice. Below the ice is that liquid water ocean, like I mentioned. And then we think the liquid water ocean is actually touching a hot, rocky core of the moon. And what's even more exciting is that there seems to be evidence of um, volcanic activity happening at the floor of Enceladus's oceans. And so that means that um, there could be kind of these hydrothermal vents or these volcanic vents at the bottom of Enceladus's oceans, very similar to the bottom of Earth's oceans. So remember strain 121, that single-celled organism um, that exists at the bottom of Earth's oceans, something like that could exist um, in Enceladus's oceans. Now, the last place I wanted to talk about um, before I run out of time is another of Saturn's moons called Titan. Now, Titan is, in on one sense, it's very Earth-like. In another sense, it couldn't be any more alien. Um, so Titan is a really fascinating place. It doesn't have liquid water like Enceladus does. And I should also say, Enceladus isn't the only moon in our solar system that has liquid water. Jupiter's moon Europa also has liquid water, a uh, liquid water ocean, and also one of Jupiter's moons, Ganymede, may have uh, a liquid water ocean as well. Now, Titan is too cold to have a liquid water ocean, um, so it goes all the way down to minus 180 degrees Celsius. And Titan looks like the lower left-hand image. 
um, it has these kind of orangish clouds that are made up of ethane, which is a natural gas that we find here on the Earth. But if you see through those clouds, what you see are large lakes on the surface of this moon. But they're not liquid water lakes, they're actually liquid methane lakes. And so liquid methane can exist at much colder temperatures than what liquid water can exist. So that, that image on the right that I have, that's actually a large lake that you can see on the surface of this particular moon. Okay, so I'm just gonna skip through that slide, but, but you know, like I mentioned, um, this moon, in, in one sense, it's nothing like the Earth because of how cold it is, and its atmosphere is made mainly of methane instead of, and, and it has um, ethane clouds instead of water vapor clouds. Um, and then, then it has these large liquid methane lakes and seas instead of liquid water lakes and seas like we have here on the Earth. But in another sense, it looks very similar to the Earth. So for example, Titan has polar clouds, just like the Earth has polar clouds, but those clouds are made up of methane and ethane um, instead, of, instead of water vapor and, and water ice. And then also the Earth, for example, has evident, well, I mean, the Earth has sand dunes that are made um, from wind, um, and Titan actually also has dunes that are made up of wind on the surface of the planet, or on the surface of the moon, rather. So it's very possible that some form of life could exist on Titan, but it would be very different to the life that we find here on the Earth because of its lack of liquid water present. Okay, now just to, to finish up, um, I know I'm, I'm running a little bit over on time, but I just want to say, um, when it comes to studying life in our solar system and studying life in space, I just want to talk very briefly on the, the possibility and the probability that there's life out there, um, outside of the Earth. Um, so, of course, we have eight planets in our solar system, but we know that there are a lot more planets than that. But most of these planets are outside of our solar system, and they're called exoplanets. So exoplanets are just planets that orbit other stars outside of our solar system. So far, we've found 4,000 exoplanets out there in our galaxy, and over 4,000 exoplanets that we found out there in our galaxy. However, we know that there are going to be more exoplanets than that. Just inside of our galaxy, the Milky Way, there are 300 million stars. And what we know about star and planet formation is that around every star, there, it will be very likely there's at least one exoplanet that forms. So there might actually be 300 million exoplanets just in our galaxy. However, there are a lot of galaxies out there. Our Milky Way galaxy isn't the only one. And each of those galaxies will have their own stars and their own exoplanets. And actually, on average, there are one to two, or in total, there are one to two trillion galaxies out there in our universe, each with hundreds of millions of stars and possibly exoplanets as well. And so what that means is that it's very possible that there are 10 to the 23 stars and exoplanets in our entire universe. Now that number is so large, that is a one with 23 zeros behind it. That is how many stars and possible exoplanets there are in our entire universe. So there will be life out there, it's just a matter of finding it. But to be completely honest, our solar system is the best place to keep searching. And the reason why that is, is because the closest exoplanet we found to our own solar system is called Proxima b. And with our current technology, it is still, it would take us 40,000 years to reach Proxima b, our nearest exoplanet. And so we need to keep looking in our own solar system if we are going to search for life.